Hello again, everybody. Well, you've just been hearing about cities and uh, the role that cities can play in, in combating the diabetes epidemic. We're going to flip it around and look at citizens, the people living in these cities, the patient's perspective on all of this. You can't hear me? Nope. All right, we're working on that. Tell me, when you can you hear me now? All right, I'm going to keep talking. We'll see if we can get this, get this down, everybody. Thumbs up in the back. All right, we're back. We're talking about patients. We're talking about citizens, the role of the individual in, in all of these issues that we've been uh, tossing around this morning. Let me introduce the panel I've got with me. Christelle Apriliano, who's the CEO of the Diabetes Collective. Next to her on sofa number one, we'll call it, uh, Laurie Rose Benson, uh, who is with YMCA of Greater New York. Welcome. Kelly Close, who's the president and founder of Close Concerns, which is working to try to make all of us uh, smarter about diabetes and, and obesity risks. And Dr. Ronald Tamler, who is the medical director at Mount Sinai here in New York. So welcome to you all. Um, let me start, Christelle, you, you blog about your own experience with type one right. diabetes. And I was struck by what you posted yesterday. You were waiting to board the plane in Tampa yes. to fly up here for today's event. And you wrote that thinking about this event was keeping you from sleeping soundly. Why? A lot of this is, is that when we look at diabetes, diabetes is complex, and that there are so many things that surround, and it's not just treatment, and it's not just being able to say, get more exercise or eat healthier. Uh, it is making sure that the psychosocial aspects, the cultural aspects are all met, and we're failing that right now. And until we deal with the cultural aspects where if you grew up in a family where it's food based mm -hmm. and even if you have these wonderful educational programs and prevention programs that first birthday party is going to be a let's just have a little piece of cake that's okay and it's a slippery slope I also don't think that in some cases programs that are currently in place are sustainable long term I've been type 1 for 32 years. I know individuals with type 1 are living much longer. People with type 2 are living much longer. And what's happening in, is we get burned out. Type 1 and type 2 both get burned out. So until we address the burnout, until we address the psychosocial aspects of the diabetes um, spectrum, I think that we're, we're far away from solving the complex equation that's diabetes. And, and you, wrote, you posed some questions that get to right at the heart of the divide that we've been wrestling with throughout this morning. You know, you wrote, how do you tell somebody to go for a walk for half an hour every day when there's no safe place for them to walk? Right. How do you test individuals for prediabetes when they can't afford to go to a clinic? Yes. If, yeah. if, if the individuals who need the services the most aren't even aware that the services are available because the only time that they'll go see a physician or a clinic is when something is very, very wrong. We are treating the disease as acute care and rather than preventative. We're not being proactive. And so until we make decisions and make cultural changes as a society to take the stigma away of diabetes, because I can guarantee you more people than you would expect in your family or your workplace have diabetes, but nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. And until we start talking about it and stop blaming individuals, because it's not because you're sedentary, it's not because you ate too much sugar, it's the fact is, is that there are so many metabolic factors. Even if you do all the right things, sometimes you get diabetes. And so rather than saying, you brought this on yourself, let's as a community solve it. Lori Rose, that mm -hmm. tees up your work very well. You're with YMCA here in New York. Y'all have yes. got a number of interesting initiatives going on with diabetes. What are you finding actually works that people connect <laughs> with and seem to be able to follow through on? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we're so happy to be part of this conversation today because what we're able to do at the Y is really to bring that very public health medical conversation to the community. And because of the the wide-reaching efforts because of our infrastructure and sort of our, our history that people know us a little bit more for gym and swim and wellness, but we're, we're boots on the ground and a, and a trusted yeah. brand that can help deliver lifestyle-based programs to the community. So one of the most exciting programs is 
ROI Diabetes Prevention Program, which is based upon the CDPP model. It's a lifestyle change, making small changes in physical activity, in healthy eating, uh, healthy weight, and it's really about prevention. Right? And how does it work? Anybody can walk in and sign up? Yeah, anyone yeah, can okay. be part of it. In New York City, we really try to eliminate the barriers, so we have not turned anyone away uh, due to inability to pay for this program, which is not a very high cost program. Um, it starts off with 16 weeks, facilitated by a lifestyle coach in a small group setting, so the participants get to know each other, get to build community, get to offer suggestions, and, and hold each other accountable. And then after that, it moves into a more bi-monthly uh, monthly maintenance program. But, but what's really exciting about this is the partnership with public health and with colleagues like Dr. Tandler at Mount Sinai. I mean, we can't do this alone, and we now have a referral base in New York City of about 400 individual physicians, 200 practices, um, and we know that we have to get the message out not just to the folks, to our community members, but also to the physicians to know that, that we're here and we want to work with you. Okay. Refer your patients to us so we can help in that very critical prevention period. Ronald, one of the themes that's come up this morning is that doctors are not getting training in medical school, that it doesn't, uh, that they are not working with patients in terms of prevention, in terms of diet, nutrition, counseling, all kinds of things that might help detect diabetes earlier, diagnose it earlier, prevent it earlier. Talk a little bit about, you know, as this epidemic expands, how hospitals are changing the way they interact with patients. Or be specific about Mount Sinai. So, um, first of all, doctors can get the training if they have an interest. So I'm a certified diabetes educator, a nutrition support That's physician. Right. If you want to do it, the, the resources to learn it are there and are available. And increasingly, um, medical schools are taking the diabetes epidemic and the obesity epidemic very seriously. Now, incentives matter. Right? Um, how do you herd cats? You break out the tuna. So, <laughs> so doctors will do, doctors generally want to do the right thing, but if the incentive is to churn through as many patients as possible in a practice where you get rewarded for only when you touch a patient and only when you do a procedure, meaning that you get rewarded when somebody comes in with the, with the complication already, then you will get those results. You will get more procedures and you will get less prevention. And what is happening right now in healthcare and specifically at Mount Sinai is that we're moving towards something that is called population health. Mm -hmm. And that means that we are now increasingly being rewarded for doing a good job in preventing badness, preventing bad outcomes. The problem is that right now we live in a mixed system where the rewards are still very much stacked towards um, uh, re being rewarded for procedures. But that's about to change massively over the next few years. And to give you an example, um, last month, we took a panel of all the patients in a primary care clinic at Mount Sinai Beth Israel um, with poor diabetes results, poor A1C results, or no A1C results, precisely the people who were not coming to the doctor. And we just started calling them. And we said, do you want to see, a, do you want to be seen in a diabetes specialty clinic with a nutritionist, with certified diabetes educators? You are at super high risk for bad outcomes. Please come to us, we're reaching out to you. And the result by and large was excellent, but there were a lot of people who were seriously weirded out. And we said, I don't wanna see the doctor, leave me alone. And so what we're struggling with now is this divide between personal responsibility, personal freedom, and the creeping kind of nanny state that we're in. And, and it's, it's difficult, you know, your personal freedom and being offered choices and being offered options, but then the incentives being that, you know, increasingly institutions want to take care of you. And do you as an individual even want that? Right. It's an interesting divide. As a practical example, if I walk into Mount Sinai today and seem like a candidate uh, for di at, at risk for diabetes, would I have a very different experience than I would have 20 years ago? Well, first of all, looking at you, you're unlikely to be a candidate for diabetes. You don't look like, um, you know, I mean, you it, a, a lot know. you don't know. So what we're finding is that different people have different risks and then need different treatments for diabetes. 
So we're finding not just a divide between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but also that the um, uh, Hispanic patient who is 40 years old um, and uh, overweight and obese needs to be addressed in a different way than the Caucasian 80-year-old uh, lady. But so stay with, stay with our overweight Hispanic 40-year-old, yes. you say he's a male. He walks in, does he have a different experience than he would have 20 years ago? Um, most certainly, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, we, we know a lot more about diabetes. We have a lot more at our disposal. We also know more about the cultural aspects of diabetes and cultural backgrounds. And actually, that is something that Mount Sinai medical students are trained in, in the sensitivity towards different cultures, how different cultures perceive food, how different cultures have different support systems uh, in, in place that you can leverage. Um, and, and so you really have to be much more specific towards the background of each patient. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's much better technology. There's much better um, uh, uh, pharmacology. Um, but the reality is that because there is now more patients and very few endocrinologists relative to these patients, right? 30 million people with diabetes, a little over 4,000 endocrinologists. Um, so how do we work that? How do we work that out? If, if I can add to that just really quickly, I mean, another thing that didn't exist 20 years ago is that physicians can now refer pre-diabetic patients to yes. the Y. So for example, awesome. we've had 1,500 New Yorkers complete the program um, over the last five years, and they've lost collectively 10,300 plus pounds, and specifically at Mount Sinai, We've held classes at Mount Sinai clinics. We've had 12 classes over the last few years. We've had over 200 referrals, and almost 100 people go through the program, 500 pounds, just from Mount Sinai patients right there. So that's a whole other strategy, especially if people don't want to necessarily be in that clinical setting, and they're not already diagnosed with diabetes. Right. So this is one positive development, as Ronald, you will now be referring your patients right to Lori Rose at the Y. There you go. So, so to, give you, to, to give you a sense of how this works, because people want to you know, refer out, we have a shortcut in our electronic medical record that is um, dot, uh, .dpp, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the, the, the referral to the YMCA, which is on the premises at Mount Sinai. So this is this collaboration with the community is very important because we realize that we as medical institutions cannot do everything, and that's why community-based organizations are just so important. Kelly, let me bring you in. I was noticing on your uh, on your Twitter feed, you, you uh, yesterday were tweeting out the news release from the International Diabetes Federation, this staggering number uh, that 415 million people worldwide now have yeah. diabetes. You wrote about how that means it's, it's not just a health crisis, it's an economic crisis, yeah. just if you look at the healthcare costs of treating that. And then you made an interesting point about how, you know, if you flip that around, how you use financial incentives uh, to promote healthier lifestyles to persuade people. Would you talk about that? Yeah, I, um, yeah, and just you know, picking up this panel is amazing sure. so far, right? There's so many interesting, important pieces, right? The psychosocial piece, the incentive piece, yeah. the, and the incentive one is really interesting. I mean, it is about motivating patients. It's also about motivating societies and about motivating healthcare providers, right? So we want to make sure that the best and the brightest leaving medical school are wanting to go treat the biggest public health problem of our time. And I'm not positive that that's happening. So I, I, I love you know, hearing about what Dr. Tamler's doing at Mount Sinai, amazing leadership there with Ken Davis. They do get motivation and they do get incentives and in how to start to engage people with, with you know, opportunities like at the way. I'm not sure that this is actually happening you know, in many of the cases where people with diabetes are doing the worst or where people at the highest risk live. So getting back to the motivation, I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't as a patient really want to hear about it as the nanny state and all yeah. of that. I, I mean, to me, it's more like, you know, what do we get to do with our doctors and medical institutions and society yeah. so that we, we can um, bring, this, bring this problem around and address it in society, in culture, in every piece of what we're doing. In just a moment, I'm going to open it up because I want to make sure we get to as many of your questions as I can. But just one quick news you can use, plug of the morning. Um, you know, one of the one of the figures that I think has been bandied around is that of the of the uh, many Americans, growing number of Americans who have diabetes, maybe something like one in four have it and don't 
knew it. Yes. Um, and Ronald, you pointed to a, uh, a risk calculator at diabetes.org. I, I went on and last night and did this, and it takes like 60 seconds. It's really easy. Yeah. You're right. I came out of one, so I'm 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 good on diabetes. But but are, is that something you're encouraging patients to? to oh, very much do? so. Um, not just patients, but relatives mm -hmm. of patients, because as we know, there's a very strong, especially for type two diabetes, there's yeah. a very strong family tied risk. Um, and so uh, I would like to give a shout out um, to the the, um, the American Diabetes Association. Um, uh, which is responsible for diabetes.org. And, you know, just go there, take your risk calculator, and you'll also find great resources. Um, and yes, diabetes, I always get asked when I do media appearances, uh, what are the symptoms of diabetes? And I said, you know, it's a silent disease for the most part. Mm -hmm. There are no symptoms. You don't know until you get the complications. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is very important as we're thinking about it in a public health perspective. Um, because uh, up until fairly recently, health insurances wouldn't even reimburse for A1C testing, which is a blood test, to screen for diabetes. So I think that um, as we're moving forward as a society, mm -hmm. we just have to recognize that this is a silent disease and that we need to invest into screening for it. Well, and I think I, that gets it, Crystal's no, point also about the psychosocial and taking away stigma, right? Oh, um, yeah. Which is such an incredibly key piece of this. The, the one thing I just wanted to add, I, I love what Kelly said about incentives, um, and there's the incentivizing the patient and the physician, but one thing that, that our team at the Y is really working closely with is incentivizing employers, yes. right? And so as Dr. Townwood talked about, mm -hmm. this could be a covered benefit. So Judy Ozeal and Jordan Correa and Elena Garcia here from the Y, I mean, they are pounding the pavement every day to say, hey, do you know at New York University that this is a covered benefit for your employees at the New York Archdiocese and, and we could hold classes there for you. And then how do we get other employers or other healthcare um, payers to, to take this on so we can continue to build capacity in this area? Great point. Let's open it up to audience questions. Uh, this gentleman right here, hidden behind the column. There you got him. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? We can. Yes. I'm Dr. Hello. Don Guastafaro, not MD music education nice. uh, oh. and uh, yeah <laughs> uh, I just wanted to share uh, my personal experience very quickly uh, probably about eight years ago I was diagnosed with prediabetes my dad was a diabetic his brother had both legs amputated mm -hmm. and uh, my doctor at the time put me on metformin with after, after a year didn't work and I'd wake up in the middle of the night with a reading of 60 uh, uh, with my glyburide a half glyburide so I my lovely wife, uh, who we've been married about seven years, Jia Lily, was a Western doctor in China, and here I mastered acupuncture specializing in diabetes, got me on uh, a program uh, which uh, has lowered my sugar from 15 to 20 points uh, with diet and exercise, but also with diluted green tea, uh, eight cups a day. So uh, I don't know if anyone else has experienced that, with acupuncture and uh, green tea, does anyone? So it's something for you to look into. So that, that's what I wanted to ask and share. Thank you for your comment. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Another question. Actually, can I comment on that? Because, comment, and then we'll come to you. We'll get a mic. Um, Please. So I'm, I'm thrilled that this has worked for you. Um, and, you know, glyburide is a medication that a lot of physicians are now moving away from because of the said side effect that you experienced. It's dirt cheap, but, you know, it has serious side effects um, such as low okay, blood sugar. Um, um, I see it the other way. So first of all, metformin started out as a nutritional supplement over 100 years ago as Galega officinalis. And um, uh, then it got turned into when something successful, usually pharma figures it out and tries to make it into something that they can sell. Sorry. Um, and so, so um, uh, metformin is now a pretty safe derivative of that original plant-based treatment for diabetes. Um, I find the opposite. I find that people want to trust in natural remedies like cinnamon and like chromium. And um, some of them do a little bit of something, but they're just not comparable in their strength to you know, what they might need. And then that delays treatment. So I'm all for putting cinnamon in your, in your coffee. It doesn't hurt you. 
but please do not delay treatment for diabetes um, uh, with pharmacologic agents if it's needed. So well, what was cool to see is this works for you, you yeah. know, and I think we all really need to focus on, like, as a population, you know, we need to think about what are the cultural and societal things that can change, like the programs at the Y and all of that, but we need to understand for patients an individualized strategy. And I mean, I, so I have to say the whole pharma company thing, I mean, that was, that, that, pains me because for me as a patient, I mean, I was in the emergency room 24 times over 12 years when I was first diagnosed with diabetes before insulin analogs came along. And so I think we gotta move beyond some of these, you know, old generalizations about different people or different institutions. We all have to really work together. Manufacturers, society, cities, patients, patient advocacy groups, et cetera. And let's not, you know, sort of promulgate some of the old um, myths. Um, yeah. I mean, what is the myth? Fun? Well, just you said, oh, you know, you said you, you made some, some um, a bit of a scathing reference on that big pharma, pharma always wants to do this. I mean, are you kidding? You know, like, I, I mean, we want to see thriving commercial yeah. markets because that is the only way we're going to develop so, these so therapies think, that go generic, I think, which we all want to I see. I think, so first of all, metformin is generic and is very now. safe. Um, and that was not scathing, that was ironic. Um, I, I hope that that was not lost. Um, so the, 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 so uh, we all, part, we all want to partner together. And I think the point that I want to make is do not delay treatment yes. by, totally. um, you, can, you can use nutritional supplements as an adjunct. It might be working for you, but do not delay treatment if you have uncontrolled diabetes and rely solely on nutritional supplements if it remains uncontrolled. Okay. That was the central thing. Your diabetes may vary. And oh. that is the right. standard watchword in our community. Your diabetes is not my diabetes. Kelly and I both have type one. We have different treatment plans. Every single individual needs to use decision making with their physicians for treatment plans. With their physicians and also with their peers. I mean, it's really cool to see this morning Humana um, announced this partnership with Omada. You know, Omada has so much cool peer-based work going on because we can't rely only on the doctors. We love you, you know, and we can't rely only on nurses. We have to figure out how to do more in the community, which so picks up on all of the, you know, the cool programs that Y has going. And so. just we're coming to your question in a second, but we were just speak, quickly speaking before we came on stage about advances being made right now in terms of figuring out, we, we tend to break this down into these bland sounding type one, type two, the, these terms, but the, within type two, we're discovering there are lots of different types in there that are going to require different treatments and strategies and approaches. Yes, there was a woman over here who's had her hand up. Hi, I'm Ellen Murphy. I'm Vice President of Communications for the YMCA, and I'm truly passionate about this program. And I'm passionate about it because my mother has type 1 diabetes. And the, the point that really uh, struck me was when you were talking about the stigma. And, you know, in our family, it was a dirty little secret that mom had type 1 diabetes, and episodes would happen, and people around her wouldn't know how to help her. So I guess my question is, you know, what can we do collectively to erase that stigma and have people embrace their disease so those around them can help them? That's the $64,000 question today. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, I mean, what we're looking at is this is a public awareness campaign, and it is not just awareness, because World Diabetes Day is we talk a lot about statistics and, and everything else, but when, when the diabetes month is over, the majority of us go back to not talking about diabetes. We have to continue to talk about it. We have to continue to, to share our stories. We have to continue to have peers in our community take back the idea that we are victims that we brought upon ourselves. A lot of us live great lives, and a lot of us want to be able to show others how to live well. And it doesn't matter if you have type one or type two, my philosophy is the same. We all want to live well, live as long as possible with as few com complications as possible. So it, in order to take away that dirty little secret, we have to shine a light on it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just telling what the symptoms are, but sharing that you can live a very healthy life with the treatments that are available today. And okay. Helen, I, I just also think, I mean, what can we do as a society also breaking down the stigma related to mental health? You know, the mental health piece of this is massive and it's incredibly underfunded. So getting 
resources there is something we'd love to see as patients. A couple of, we've got two hands up over here. Let me see if we can get, oh, we've got one back there and we'll come up. Hi. How are you? Um, I cover diabetes as an editor and I work with a doctor at, um, Put the um, mic a little sorry, closer in to Montefiore who covers at-risk populations in the Bronx. And one of the things he's told me, I thought the idea of incentives was really interesting because one of the things he had said is there are all these amazing therapies, um, but they're not available because a lot of people are on public assistance, um, Medicaid or Medicare. So um, I was wondering if maybe someone could talk about are there incentives that we can offer to health insurance companies to make some of these more effective therapies um, available to those patients? Um, just kind of like the person who had said in the past, um, discussion about changing the farm bill so that we are supporting fruits and vegetable subsidies and not corn, for example. Okay, who wants to tackle that one? I mean, I could say something from the prevention standpoint. So for example, specifically at, at Montefiore, we've been working with you guys over the last few years and thinking about how we could build capacity, not just with our teams coming to work at your clinics, but also training your staff to then incorporated into their daily work. So from the incentive from the, the local healthcare worker, you know, how can we build up um, their tool kit so that they can also have that boots on the ground support and we can continue to build capacity from this sort of communi community-based preventative approach? And um, uh, from, so from the other side of prevention, um, let's, if, if maybe one of the outcomes of this panel could be that we could all band together and lobby uh, CMS for Medicare mm -hmm. to pay for continuous glucose yes. monitoring devices for Medicare beneficiaries. Because as people with type 1 diabetes who are at serious risk for low blood sugar and not noticing low blood sugar get over 65 and now have Medicare, Medicare does not cover this. And what happens is that we then see these people with diabetes in the emergency room over and over yeah. again until they break a hip or until something even worse happens. <laughs> and it's just one of those counterintuitive governmental things where it's very clear on the face of it that you're going to be saving lives and you're going to be saving money, but it's just not happening. And as a clinician, I'm, I, I'm, I'm just tearing out my hair. So maybe we can shine a light on this and on other matters that are of great importance and of immediate financial, you know, there's a, an immediate financial outcome to this that is beneficial to society. Um, and, and so maybe this event can help further this advocacy. So Mary Louise, one of the interesting Kelly. things this morning, you know, when you mentioned um, the piece about how much we're spending of Medicare dollars goes to diabetes and, mm -hmm. you know, how many dollars that is, and there was kind of a gasp in the room, right? But I mean, 83% of people over 65 in the United States have diabetes or pre-diabetes. And I, I think it's incredible what the Atlantic is doing here today in spotlighting this, shining the light on it. This is what actually helps reduce stigma. And you know, to the point back there, getting the media all over this and understanding it, and then looking at how patients can help. So not just doctors advocating for yeah. changes in government, but also it's, it's all kinds of patients. Yeah. So patients, um, I co-founded an organization called the Diabetes Patient Advocacy Coalition. And we try to be the big blue easy button. And by simply clicking a few buttons, we can let our policymakers know that changes need to be made. 29 million, it's not just 29 million people with diabetes, it's 29 million families, it's employers, it's our healthcare system. And if we don't talk about it and we don't ask our government and other policymakers, even in your, your local state, to get involved as patients, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Thank you. And Quick and question right here. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm a clinician by, by training. I, I work in health economics and outcomes research for a global pharmaceutical company. And I think I was, I was very interested in what you said, Dr. Tamler, about the incentives kind of being a little bit backwards for physicians. So can you share some innovative things that Mount Sinai is doing to kind of turn that coin? How are you going to, how do you uh, incentivize physicians to either use highly effective therapies that may end up costing patients more or costing systems more? How do you incentivize physicians to, to focus better on, on, on providing better care, quality ones? 
Wow. That's, um, so uh, next week. How we, long have we got? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So next week we have. 64,000 so, so the first thing that Mount Sinai did was to create this Mount Sinai Clinical Diabetes Institute, which is a mouthful. But what it means is that I've got over 100,000 patients. Um, so I'm a little booked. No, just kidding. Um, so um, what this means is that um, not everybody can see an endocrinologist. So our job is to turn primary care doctors, cardiologists, nephrologists, HIV specialists, and diabetes educators, nurses, medical assistants into little mini diabetes specialists, make those educational resources broadly available, and then tie it to dashboards that monitor how our population is doing. Um, there's, of course, you know, incentives. You, you, you talk about money. And so within primary care, um, our primary care doctors are now increasingly getting paid based on how their population is doing to the point where our director of primary care told me, no, 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 I want this patient to see my nutritionist because I want this patient to do well because my doctors get dinged when our diabetes population does poorly. So that creates great incentives. Now, the other piece to this, the other part to the educational piece is being sensitive to the true cost of diabetes care. And part of that is informing people, you know, what is the best way of prescribing metformin? You know, there's generic metformin mm -hmm. extended release. Yes. But if you prescribe metformin extended release 1,000 milligrams, it's, a, it's $400 a month. When you prescribe 500, it's $5 a month. So you have to know all these nuances. If you need insulin, I think it's Novo that has a collaboration with one of the major retailers in this country where you can get insulin for $25 a vial um, under a different brand. Um, but it, everybody knows it's made by Novo. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think that um, there's a lot of education that needs to come out. Part of it is also to steer the electronic medical record towards helping people, you know, nudging people to make the right decisions. Did your patient get a flu vaccine? And you know, you have to keep clicking it away. And at some point, it's just easier to just give the flu vaccine than to click it away. Yeah. Is your patient taking a cholesterol medicine, which actually, and that's very important, has a huge effect on uh, mor mortality and morbidity in people with diabetes, much, much more so than managing teeny tiny differences in blood sugar. I think some of the cool stuff at Mount Sinai is related to systems, and I think all of us need to understand there's been amazing progress in science. We need to see more of it, but systems is also huge, and behavior. Right. And I have to break us there, but I want to I want to close with serious lightning round, like one or two word answer from each of you. What gives you hope? You were just telling me at breakfast you're in line for a bionic pancreas. So for me, yeah. my one word Super short. is bionic pancreas. <laughs> it's Island. two, but we'll let you have it. Dr. Damiano. Uh, partnerships. Partnerships. Public I mean, private. Public private. Uh, the Department of Health the healthcare organizations, the individual physicians, understanding where we all intersect in this really complex puzzle and how we can play a, a big part in, in helping to solve this picture. Kelly. Cultural, social, science, more focus on all of it. Events like this, it sounds like, yes. getting, us, getting us all in the same room. Ronald, um, last word. Wow, I, get the last, I never get the last word. <laughs> um, you get one. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Partnership with community. All right. A good note to end on. Thank you very much to all of you. Christelle, Lori Rose, Kelly Ronald. Thank you.